The God Punk by Jerome Bixby This story appeared in Worlds of Tomorrow, December of 1963. Extensive research by Project Gutenberg did not uncover any evidence that the U.S. copyright on this publication was renewed. In the shadows of a crater wall on Phobos, moon of Mars, Gurg and Yurl waited to greet the god. If the god continued its present rate of approach, it would land within moments. Gurg and Yurl had journeyed all night, with their eyes on that distant, glinting speck in the sky. Over cold-crusted sand dunes and jagged crater walls, they had flowed, crept, bounded, oozed, toward a spot where the god must land if its course held true. Gurg was a physik, which is the equivalent of high priest. Yurl was a physik or much higher priest. The best wishes of their people had gone with them on their tremendous mission. Now, at the place, they trembled in every tentacle as they peered upward. The rust-red orb of Mars rode the black horizon. Mars was, as Gurg and Earl had learned from their elders, and now taught their youngers, the stern, all-seeing eye of it who was the universe. From that great eye, a day ago, had sprung a shining messenger, an emissary, a god that must be coming on a purposeful visit. It had been detected at the halfway point of its tramp, but there could be no doubt regarding its origin, its nature, its destination. For, in the matter of form, the god was a close replica of Gurg and Earl, of all the creatures of their race. It was octopidal, with sinewy double tentacles and a thinking trunk and a reproduction pouch. The only significant difference was that the god gleamed mysteriously, as if its angular, hard-line representation of normal form were cast in shining stone. As it flew, it reflected starlight and the red glow of the universal eye behind it from its sleek surfaces. Gurg and Earl blinked their own dull-surfaced, astronomically far-sighted rust-red eyes at each other in supreme excitement and anticipation. What would the god tell them? What would it reveal? Would it divulge the cosmic secret? Would it tell them the place and destiny of their lowly race? Had it come to punish them for not being good enough, for over-reproducing, for worshipping improperly? From a selfish standpoint, it might even tell them how to get rid of the plink, a subject of constant prayer. How smoothly it flew! While Gurg and Yurl and their people could bound about with a great agility in Phobos's light gravity, they could not fly. How wonderful it would be to fly, said Earl. Perhaps, said Gurg, we have been found ready to be taught. Then Gurg twitched as a plink bit him, just under the front left double tentacle. He combed the light fur there, found the plink, and shredded it casting the pieces round about so that no two of them might combine to form another plunk. How wonderful it would be also if the god could tell them how to get rid of the itching, crawling, parasitic plunk whose bite in sufficient numbers was often fatal. The god began to land. It shot red flame downward from its mouth on the underside of its gleaming body. Red flickers and sharp-edged black shadows danced about the two who waited below. They shrank back, fearful that the display might be a disapproving communication. Yet they held their ground, knowing they had lived good lives and deserved no condemnation on any score they could imagine. The god lowered on its belching tongue of flame the flame that seemed a tiny part, a sliver of the universal eye that watched. 
Strange marks were on the side of the god's body. They were First Mars Expedition, U.S. Space Force, Planet to Satellite Crew Boat Number 2. The last few moments of the god's descent were quite rapid. Simultaneously, the darting red flames seemed to lessen in intensity and length. Then, at the second of impact, they brightened again to previous power, but too late. The impact was hard. Gurg and Earl gasped as one of the god's double tentacles buckled, crumpled, with a glinting of shiny hard material. The flames stopped. The god, unable to remain erect with its injury, slowly toppled. Its body thudded silently, stirring pumice dust. It was motionless. Gurg and Earl stared at each other. Was the god fatally injured? Dying? Dead? For a broken tentacle meant that fluids would seep out, and soon the dry death would occur. The god stirred. It braced two sets of tentacles against the ground, as if trying to push itself erect. The effort was not successful. Again, it was motionless. The two double tentacles remained outstretched, however, and they pointed at the shadows where Gurg and Earl waited and watched. Gurg and Earl sighed in relief. The god had assumed conversation position. It must have healed its broken tentacle, truly a god. Soon it would be as good as new, for otherwise agony would forbid conversation. It was ready to address them now. This was the greatest moment of Gurg's and Earl's lives. They waited for the god to speak. It was silent. A long time passed. The god remained motionless, though in conversation position, and silent. A very long time passed. Then a tiny hole appeared in the god's side. It grew larger, larger, and then it stopped growing larger. Something appeared at the hole. It paused, then dropped to the surface of Phobos, where it began to crawl about. It bore considerable resemblance to a plink, except for its shiny, wrinkled gray skin. Plinks were purple. And this thing was huge. Huge! It was one-fifth the size of the god's body. Caught by horror and fearing the worst, Gurg and Earl waited for the god to speak. Damn, John Cotter was thinking. That was a neat bit of sloppiness, that landing. Carruthers will chew me out and in again. Pause. Holy cats, I hope the radio isn't busted, or I'll have a hell of a wait before they follow up and find me. The god was dead. Killed by the giant plink, a scourge from which, evidently, even the gods were not spared. The huge plink, even now creeping around, wrinkle-skinned and detestable, its coloration the same as the gods the most loathsome sight imaginable. A god plunk! Gurg and Earl moved into view from the shadows of the crater wall. Their thinking trunks tingled with misery, sorrow, bitter anger and disappointment. The plunk stopped, having sensed them. Then it darted for the hole it had eaten in the god. Earl moved to intercept it. The plink changed course and headed swiftly up a sand dune. With a great bound, impelled by outrage, Earl was upon it. While Gurg touched tentacles with the dead god, in reverent mourning, in terrible sorrow, in loss, in supplication, Earl shredded the god plink. Two days later, a second god was detected. It silently circled Phobos from the universal eye. It did not land. 
It silently circled Phobos and then returned to the eye. Within the day, it was back in the company of eleven other gods. They landed. Joyfully, mortals went forth to meet them. It was quite a battle while it lasted. Joy ended quickly as the gods died one by one, each of them showing the holes eaten in their sides by the insatiable plinks. Likewise, eventually, died all the plinks, which presumably had killed the gods. They fought with strange white flares and crackling blue flashes, which only tickled the hides of the faithful. Then they were shredded. Religious beliefs on Phobos underwent certain basic changes, such as the gods, or at least their messengers, were known not to be immortal. Nor were the special variety of plink which afflicted them. On Earth, twenty years afterward, word is anxiously awaited of the fourth Mars expedition.